What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taron Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. And as always, we have ourselves a jam-packed show as we have a lot to get into, such as CSUN. They have won eight in a row on men's volleyball as they swept Stanford. Second time they've taken down Stanford this season. Are the Matadors for real? And how about Charleston? Finally, they beat a ranked opponent, taking down Ohio State on the road. Are the Golden Eagles for real? And how about Penn State escaping UC Irvine with a five-set win? It was a thriller, let me tell you that. I'm going to break that down, as well as my post-game interviews. And how about USC Beach Volleyball knocking off number one UCLA? Yes, the women of Troy are not ready to hand over the crown just yet. Also, we have some more beach volleyball results to go over. And how about Newport Harbor winning that Best the West tournament? The Sailors, they're not ready to hand over the crown just yet in terms of their tournament successes. So hand me a volleyball. Set to net. Because I'm about to serve you up some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taron Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all the sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. Thank you all for joining me on this beautiful Monday evening, Monday afternoon, Monday, wherever you are listening from. Either way, you have made your way into episode 184 of Set Point. And without any further delay, let us begin. But first and foremost, Set Point would not be where it's at without IE Sports Radio providing the platform to go live on Please do follow IA Sports Radio on several different social media platforms such as Twitter, Instagram, and on TikTok at IA Sports Radio. We also have Facebook for those that still use it. All you just, you just got to do is type in the word IE, then sports, then radio, and then just like us, and then follow us on Facebook, and then poof, that's how you follow us on Facebook. We also have a website, www.iesportsradio.com. And once you go there, you will see a Patreon link at the top. And once you click it, donations start out at $5 a month if you choose to, to donate. This will get you a shout-out from all 27 of our shows, including this one. And higher tiers include IE Sports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university, and even a chance to be featured on a segment of our flagship show, The Defining Moment with Larry B. Because for the past eight years and counting, coming up on nine years, by the way, I Sports Radio has been bringing you amazing content ranging from interviewing legendary, legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. All the while, we've been content to be by the fans and for the fans, and with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. Thank you to everyone for all of your support and for making I Sports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. Shout out to our Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel, Key to the Gate, Marcus Lowscrate, and a donor that wishes to remain anonymous. And with all that said and done, let us begin. So we had ourselves quite the volleyball week in men's volleyball. It was quite an amazing week. We have to start off on Wednesday. So Hawaii got their championship rings. It had been a long time coming, but they got their championship rings from last season. Charlie Wade said those rings were pretty much were kind of better from last year. But championship rings are championship rings. You can't complain about them. Like, you get the rings no matter what happens. As Pepperdine came into town against Hawaii. So, first set, Hawaii pulled no punches. They won that first set 25-15. And then the second set, Pepperdine actually showed up. They were not going to get shown up at the so F- Simplify Arena, a.k.a. Stan Sheriff Center, that... Pepperdine won that second set, 22-25. Then the third set, Hawaii took control over that third set. They won it 25-22. Then in the fourth set, 
Hawaii built a fairly big lead, and I even tweeted out a little too early. It looks like if you were hoping for a fifth set, or if you were hoping for this match to go Cinco sets, you might have to wait until Friday. But to the credit of Pepperdine, they were able to climb their way back into the set, but Pepperdine just could not get that that those points to just basically not the set up or not the match up as Hawaii took that fourth set 25-21 and the match. There was even a point in the match where Cole Bogner had a one-handed block. It was just amazing. I think it was either a block or a joust. Either way, it was just flat out amazing. And the rematch between these two was no bet. I wouldn't say it was no better, but it was a sweep but for Hawaii as Hawaii won at 25-19, 25-18, and 25-21. There's a reason why I didn't choose this as my match slash, slash series of the week. Just because as much as I think this is a great series, it's at Hawaii. And Hawaii does really good at Stan Sheriff Center. So first of all... It's nothing against Pepperdine. Pepperdine is a very good team. Jalen Jasper is a fantastic player. So, I, I'm this is no knock on them. So, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Pepperdine. I think they're going to be good, especially in the MPSF. However, they're just not on Hawaii's level. And everyone mocks Hawaii for their schedule. But I even said it in my previews. This was the first... Big first of three important weeks for Hawaii, and they got the first week out of the way, and ne- the next two weeks are basically going to be very important for them. And this actually, this uh, the fifteen and zero start actually ties the uh, second best start in program history. So for Hawaii, it's basically. It's basically a strong start to their se- to their season. Yes, it's not been the strongest schedule, but honestly, it's start- it's now going to start to pick up, and I really think that they're really going to be the schedule is now officially picking up, and I think this is going to really test them, and I I think that this is their chance to really prove themselves, and. I think Hawaii definitely is deserving of the number one ranking. Yeah, they're currently ranked number one, and there's no there's no way they're they were going to lose that number one ranking. So for Hawaii, they definitely are a number one caliber team, and they have number one caliber players. So overall, it was business as usual for Hawaii. They looked so strong in that. Uh, in that uh, second match, and there was some other history that they made in terms of, like, their home games as well as, uh, it it was some sort of, like, home game winning streak that they won in that, uh, in that, uh, first match, but either way, I'm blank, I'm honestly blanking on it, It, uh, oh, it was 27 consecutive home win home wins. It's now 28 after they beat Pepperdine the second go around. So, they've now won 28 consecutive home games, which is a which is a program record, which I think is incredible and again, Hawaii is just out there breaking records and I think it's they're out to kick butt and take names and I'm in, I'm interested to see what they're going to do this week. Like I said, the first the first of three important weeks was gotten out of the way. Pepperdine was an obvious check mark. Now this week, they've got the Outrigger Invitational. I'll get more into that a little bit later. And then I guess I won't spoil what's next week. Next week is Long Beach State, which is, their first of all, their conference opener, Big West conference opener. And I guess that's also, well, not I guess, but it's also a rematch of last year's NCAA Men's Volleyball Championship match between the Beach and the Rainbow Warriors. Their first meeting since the two teams met in the national championship last year. So, but that's not until next week. So I'm going to save that for next week. All right, so that is that for Pepperdine Hawaii. Moving over to Friday, we also had CSUN defeating Stanford in straight sets. So 
Stanford was number nine at the time, while CSUN was 14. And I actually made a mistake when I tweeted out my team of the week. So I said Stanford was number 10 at the time, so oops. But it still just means that uh, I gave Stan- or CSUN my team of the week for week number nine. Uh, oh no, I was right. So Stanford was was actually uh, number uh, 10 at the time. So Stanford was number 10 at the time, and then CSUN was number 14. So while the sets were fairly close, CSUN won the match in straight sets, 25-21, 25-23, and 26-24. This was actually the first time CSUN defeated Stanford twice in one season since 2018. So Theo Edwards has really turned this program around, and I'm quite impressed with how the Matadors have really turned their program around. Normally, they've been looked at as, like, the doormat of the Big West Conference, but now they've really improved drastically. And one of their bigger wins was against Stanford. This was back when Stanford was number six in the nation, and that time they had to beat Stanford in five. This time, it only needed, they only needed three sets. And Believe it or not, CSUN has won eight straight games. They have been very under the radar. They have won a quiet eight straight games. Now, you look at some of their games, or their wins over these teams. CSUN hasn't really won some of the, their better wins. I mean, the Stanford wins were amazing, obviously, in this eight-game winning streak as... They beat Stanford to start the winning streak. They beat Princeton and NJIT, also in five. They beat Farley Dickinson, Benedictine. They also beat Westcliff. They beat UC San Diego in their Big West opener. And then they just recently beat Stanford, which I think is impressive. What's even more impressive is, well, okay, they didn't beat Stanford at Stanford the first go-around. That was actually at CSUN, but they... Them be- sweeping Stanford at Stanford is very impressive because that's not an easy place to win at. So it really is impressive how the Matadors are playing such good volleyball as of late. And again, lots of credit goes to Theo Edwards. Only in his first year as head coach. I mean, he has famili- famili- familiarity. I think that's how it's pronounced. Famili- familiarity with the program. He's familiar with the program. And the dude really knows his stuff with CSUN, and I think he's really done wonders for CSUN. My thing is, can CSUN really ride this momentum all the way to the finish line through Big West Conference League? Because you look at who CSUN has next. They have two. They have a bye week this week, and then they're back in action Thursday when they play UC San Diego, and then they've got Damon following that matchup, or following UC San Diego. And then after that, they've got Hawaii at home, which they have the luxury of playing them at the Premier America Credit Union Arena, which I think is one of the worst names to name a arena. Sorry, but not sorry. And then they've got UC Irvine following that series against Hawaii, and then they've got Long Beach State. So following the UC San Diego and Damon matches, you, CSUN's schedule really picks up, especially in that Big West Conference. So that's my biggest concern is that their schedule is really going to pick up. But my thing is, is that if they're able to like be competitive against some of these teams, against these Long Beach States, these Irvines, these Hawaii's, it's not going to really matter. It's just going to show the growth that the Matadors have. Because obviously... Long Beach State, Hawaii are in a class of their own. And then Irvine is progressively getting better. But for me, I think CSUN is quietly creeping up on that radar. And they're not to be underestimated. I think CSUN has some stud players. And I think they're not to be underestimated. They've They've got good players like Kyle Hobus. That dude is indeed a great player. And... They've also got Donovan Constable as their setter. He is definitely legit. And one player who I think is going to progressively get better as time goes on, especially in the middle, is Emmanuel Wanji. Like, that dude is going to be a beast in the middle. Six foot eight, and he's eventually going to earn his stripes at the collegiate level. 
trust me on this one. CSUN got a good one with Wanji. So that's that for CSUN Stanford. Jumping back into, well, staying on into the Big West side of things, Long Beach State took down Ball State in four sets. Now, I actually went to this matchup, but I was a little late arriving. I missed the first set just because I was PA announcing junior college men's volleyball. Um, I also missed a little bit of half of the uh, second set, but I kind of didn't really miss all that much. I saw that the second set was tight, and then Long Beach State went on a little bit of a serving run, courtesy of Sotiris Shiapanis, and then they went up to nothing. Ball State really came alive in that third set, and that was when they basically... It looked as if Ball State had some momentum, and part of me really wanted to see Ball State force a fifth set, but I just think that Long Beach State caught their second wind after that third set. I think that Ball State kind of ran out of gas following that third set, and unfortunately, that's just how it is sometimes, where you're playing the number four team in the nation, and then it just it just happens sometimes. It's not a matter of Ball State was bad. It was just Long Beach State just has more firepower. When you're facing like Spencer Olivier and S- S- Sotos or S- Sotiris Chiapenis or Clark Godbold across the other side of that net, you're going to have to play some darn good volleyball. And the problem was for Long Beach State is, or the problem was for Ball State is that Long Beach State had such balance offensively. They had five different players with 10 or more kills. That's when you know you're screwed. <laughs> there's nothing there's, there's nothing Ball State can do about that. As Adam Karnick pops in the chat room, uh, he actually meant he mentions this mentions this about uh, Emmanuel Wanji says a six eight volleyball player. I can't imagine getting a spike past him. Well, there was a seven foot volleyball player back at UC Irvine, so yeah. And uh, Mike Pat says, have a great show, sir. FSU in four. I don't know how volleyball works, but that sounds right. Well, you'll have to wait for women's volleyball because that's not for another. We're currently in March. So August is – you'll have to wait for another five and a half months. And then in beach volleyball, that's a whole different – a whole different species. So, yeah. That's not how it works, buddy. But anyway, back to Long Beach State, uh, Ball State. Yeah, Ball State wasn't bad. It was just that Long Beach State had more firepower. When they, when your team has five different players with ten or more kills, that's when your offense is clicking. So after the game, I actually caught up with Ball State men's volleyball coach Donan Cruz following the match, and we talked about how... We talked about the positives of this loss and what this means going forward and what his team is going to need to do in order to have success in the MIVA and what his team is going to need to do to basically have success going forward. All right, Coach. Obviously, it's a tough loss for you all on the road against the number four team, Long Beach State. But you all battled, especially in that third set where you took a set off them. What were some positives you could take away in this match against Long Beach State? Yeah, you know, with our team right now, we just winning is the process, and learning how to win is uh, is a really important. It's a skill, you know. And I think when you watch Long Beach play, they understand how to manage some situations. And uh, I thought we saw glimpses of that, but. If you're going to win big matches, you got to play consistent and you got to be able to adjust. And I thought we did that at times, but not enough to win. Caleb has obviously been your cast, but it looks like you've unlocked a new secret weapon in this guy's name. Tanashi Deva Deva Cholskolpaska. Yep. Yeah. Tell me, what has been the upside of Tanashi? You know, he's a physical player. He uh, he contacts at a high point. His passing is getting better. Um, and, you know, he's just offensively, he's a threat. So it helps us um, spread the spread the block a little bit. Um, and I think when we're able to get our middles and right sides involved, uh, create some one-on-one situations, I think someone like T really, really helps us uh, spread our offense. Yeah, and then uh, back to Caleb. What can you say about Caleb's leadership and how he's just been such a catalyst for you all back in the past and as of right now, this season? Yeah, you know, Caleb is a special player and uh, one of those guys where you don't get those all the time and 
um, you know, with him, it's he stepped into a new role and, and really has embraced the idea of being a leader in in some intangible stuff. But uh, you know, he passes the ball really well. Obviously, a very consistent attacker, and and I think just causes some problems for teams. But uh, he's experienced, so so we rely on a lot from him. Okay, so you're on your West Coast road trip. Sunday you've got UC San Diego. Then next Wednesday you are at GCU. Next Wednesday you are at GCU, and then you're back at it in MIBA play against Ohio State Mm -hmm. in back-to-back matches. Obviously the MIBA matches are the most important. What's it going to take to obviously win the next matches, but win those MIBA matches because those are the ones that are truly important. Yeah, those are the ones that count and that's where our focus is and and coming out here obviously helps us get a good gauge on things we need to adjust and get better at, but um, you know, we'll focus on San Diego. They're a good team too and I I think uh, we're expecting some good volleyball on Sunday and you know, the goal is just carry all this momentum into uh, Ohio State on March 15th and, um, and you're right, you know, it doesn't even matter how many you win in the regular season, like you got to go to the tournament, play well, and that's where the bid is. So uh, we're focused on getting better every match, and we can do that. I think we still become a team that is uh, can cause a lot of issues for opponents. So that's where our mind is, and uh, we're just looking forward to getting better every day. And obviously being from Muncie, what have you liked about being in California as of late? Um, obviously weather's good, and you know, just being able to get the guys out and away from campus and refresh their minds is a great thing, you know. Anytime you got a chance to be in a, a beautiful place and get some team bonding is, is always a good thing. So that was my post-game interview with Donan Cruz, the head men's volleyball coach of Ball State. In the press conference today at Long Beach State with Alan Knipe, he actually gave his props to Donan Cruz and how he has done a great job with Ball State, taking them to the Final Four last season. Um, For Ball State, they actually did beat UC San Diego on Sunday, which was yesterday, and they do take on GCU, as I mentioned in the press conference. That will be discussed a little bit later, but those MIVA matches are going to be crucial just because second place could be realistic of where they're going to be finishing. Obviously, Lindenwood is looking pretty decent, Ohio State obviously looks decent. I don't think a whole lot of teams are going to be catching up to Loyola unless Loyola somehow slips up. But Ball State still is in the hunt. And the tournament, like he said, is basically where it's at. And basically, you could be the best team in the regular season and then slip up in terms of the tournament. Look at what happened with Penn State last year. They ran the table in the EIVA and then wound up losing in the EIVA tournament semifinals and wound up being the first team out of the NCAA tournament. So overall, it was a great showing from Ball State. They looked solid at times. T, as I call, as most people call him, instead of Tanashi, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name, Tanashi, um... He looked really good, and he's just been a great secret weapon for Ball State, backing up Caleb Jenis. Also got to give a shout out to Caleb Jenis for basically uh, recognizing me, and, you know, I chatted up with him afterward. He is a beast of a volleyball player. Um, I also have to give a belated shout out to Jens Feltis of njit for recognizing me at the long beach state njit men's volleyball match and i don't think i don't know if i gave him the shout out on a couple weeks ago but if i didn't um here it is and i definitely do appreciate you recognizing me and saying all the nice things about me so thank you jens i really do appreciate it so Anyway, back to the recap of the uh, NCAA men's volleyball matches. So BYU and GCU on Friday and on Saturday. So first matchup, long story short, we didn't miss much. As GCU swept BYU 25-18, 25-22, 25-21. Didn't get to see much of this matchup just because, well, I was very busy on Friday. But the second matchup did not disappoint as this time it was a barn burner. First set between BYU and GCU, round two. BYU took the set, first set, 25-22. Second set, 
GCU rebounded nicely, won that set 25-17. Then in set three, BYU rebounded from that set, won at 25-19. Then in the fourth set, it was just a cert. It was just at following that first set. It was just a set full of runs. Every time a team basically got hot, they basically just ran with it and just never relinquished the lead. That was also the case in set four. GCU won that fourth set 25-17. But then the fifth set came, and it was just tight throughout most of that fifth set. And there was and every time GCU was had their chances of pulling away, BYU just could not did not want to basically just go away. And BYU led early in that fifth set, but GCU managed to claw their way back, and eventually GCU wound up winning on a walk-off service ace, and that was how GCU was able to win that fifth set, 17-15, and they basically wound up taking two against BYU. That was huge for those lopes, just because they they can't afford too many MPSF losses, just because it looks like UCLA is becoming the big bully of the MPSF. Then we head on over to Saturday. This was kind of an underrated matchup right here. Charleston taking on Ohio State. Now, I said in my matches to, to watch for, this was number 12 Ohio State. This was actually number 13 Ohio State. So, I apologize. I'm sorry if I messed up on Ohio State's ranking number... So, I'm sorry if I gave Ohio State one more hi- ranking higher. So, my my bad, y'all. But anyway, so, first set, Ohio State narrowly won the first set, 25-23. It looked as if those Buckeyes were going to defend the Cavalli Center. But the second set, Charleston won the second set, 25-19. Then the third set, those Golden Eagles narrowly won it, 25-23. Then the fourth set, it was just back and forth. Looked as if Ohio State was going to take that that fourth set, but then Charleston pulls ahead, then Ohio State ties it up, and it was just back and forth, then it went into deuce, and then Charleston emerges victorious, wins the fourth set, 28-26, no fifth set here, and believe it or not, that was actually Charleston's first ranked win of the season, and it was a big win as well, just because you remember their last game, they got swept against George Mason, their first loss of the season. It's a huge win for those Golden Eagles just because they needed a ranked win such as that. I know it was against Ohio State, but a ranked win on the road is huge for those Golden Eagles. The fact that they were able to get that win is absolutely amazing for Charleston. And they're proving themselves that, that they deserve to be ranked. And for Ohio State kind of been a bit of a rocky road as of late they they still deserve to be ranked but they're kind of on the bubble of receiving votes and they're still being ranked but being ranked lowly and then also on saturday we had this nice little top 10 matinee matchup number six uc irvine at number nine stanford it was round two of the stanford versus big west matchup and then UC Irvine swept Stanford. This was kind of expected after CSUN swept Stanford. It was kind of close after that fir- after that first set, as UC Irvine won the first set 25-17. Second set, UC Irvine won 25-23. Then the third set, Irvine won at 25-22. It was kind of a nice little warm-up matchup for Irvine. As Irvine... They they knew they couldn't look ahead to their matchup against Penn State just because Stanford is a formidable formidable foe and that UC Irvine knows that the schedule was picking up because last week they had UCLA they dropped two in a row to those Bruins they knew they couldn't afford a third straight loss just because they had Penn State next up and then they were they knew they had the Big West Conference following that and then you also have to remember. After, before their bye, they played Pepperdine, and then before Pepperdine, they had GCU. So you have to like David Niffin's philosophy of scheduling tough opponents, trying to get that at-large bid, trying to toughen up his team, and not try to sc- schedule cupcake opponents. 
Then this leads up to the match of the week. Number three, Penn State taking on number six, UC Irvine. This was a dandy of a matchup. So like I said in my recap video yesterday, first set, it was just a barn burner. This was kind of one of those class instant classic sets. I don't think a team led by any more than two points this set. There were 22 ties in set one. 22 ties. Both teams missed 21 combined serves. I unfortunately did not count how many set points Penn State had, which is totally my fault. I totally meant to do that. But, But eventually UC Irvine... Managed to sneak away, get that first set 34-32, and you'll see you'll see the the reason why you see Irvine won that first set. Then the second set, Penn State actually led late in that in that second set, but then Irvine tied it up at 23-23. I'm thinking, all right, this is going to be another extended se- second set, but then Penn State. Won the last two points. They won it off of a block as they took that second set, 25-23. Then in set three, Irvine jumps out to a 6-2 to lead. I'm thinking, is this this is either going to be a big set for Irvine or this is going to be just like the UCLA match where the two teams met in the first meeting and then UC Irvine jumped out to an early lead and then UCLA figured it out, and then they came back to win that third set. But it wasn't, as Irvine took that third set, 25-18. Halir Heno, this dude was serving up a storm, as basically, he was just a beast. Nine service aces throughout the entire match. Confirmed by David Niffin, he had that was basically the new school record. He had the previous record, which was eight, which was set earlier this season. It was just a phenomenal way to see. Then in set four, it was pretty much Penn State leading most of the way. They were up 17-13, but then Penn, Penn State kind of lost its way. Irvine was battling back. They were serving tough once again. They tied it up at 17-17, and then Penn State rattled off five in a row. Then Irvine rattled off four in a row. It was 23-22. I'm thinking, could Irvine rally back, escape without forcing a fifth set? No. Penn State forced a fifth set. They capitalized off of Irvine's miscues. Irvine missed a serve at 23-22, trailing 23-22. And then, unfortunately, they gave... Penn State a free a pretty much a free ball which basically was just smashed over for an overpass kill and then it was basically Cinco sets time and basically this fifth set was another instant classic it was basically like a heavyweight boxing match and the side change was 8-7 in favor of Penn State it was 9-9 and like I said in my recap video Penn State went on a 3-0 run and UC Irvine sadly did not recover. Something I did not ask David Niffin. He did not take any of his timeouts, and I kind of wonder why. Now, one reason I could wonder is because Niffin probably didn't want to slow down his team's momentum, or he didn't want to give the other team a chance to rest. But either way, I kind of found it a little weird, but I just found it a little odd. And then... On the final match point, Cal Fisher served up a walk-off service ace. Just a fitting way to end, just because Cal Fisher was probably the most effective server for for Penn State tonight. Obviously, UC Irvine had Halir Heno as their effective server, but this time, Fisher was the one that had the last laugh in terms of his tough serving afterward I caught up with Penn State's Cal Fisher following his team's win over UC Irvine in five sets all right this is Karen Rodriguez of set point with Cal Fisher of Penn State men's volleyball following his team's win over UC Irvine all right Cal your team won a five set thriller over UC Irvine on the road how big of a win is this for your team as next week you all go to Hawaii 
for a grueling test. Yeah, this is definitely a huge win for us. Um, coming out here to California is always a test to play some of these bigger schools. That's a great Irvine team that we just played, and they battled, and we fought back and didn't let them take it. So it was a good match, very fun. Looking forward to the rest of it, so. Now, yesterday you also played Concordia Irvine. That was kind of a grueling match as a, you all were pushed despite winning in three. What did you all learn from that match despite sweeping the Eagles? Um, yeah, I mean, that was also a tough-fought match. We had just gotten to California, so we're still dealing with the time change, but I don't know. I think a win, the first win out here is never a bad thing, regardless of what the score was. So we'll take a sweep any day. Toby also had a big game for you all, but the offense was fairly balanced as Owen also came up big. Nihal was also big. You obviously were big. What can you say about Toby, Owen, and the rest of the offense? And what can you say about your boy Cole, who is distributing the ball well? Yeah, I mean, when you see numbers like that and see an offense that spread out, that just means our passing is doing very well. And that is an incredible serving team. So being able to battle that well and then being able to distribute to get all the hitters to action, it's a great thing, and it makes it difficult to beat us. Now, you were serving quite well. You even had the walk-off service ace. How did you have to counter their tough serving with Khalir Heno dealing nine service aces with your hot serving? It was nine? Uh, yeah, I mean, he he hit that chop serve and cut it on us a fair amount of times. Um, but I thought our passes, honestly, held it pretty well, regardless of how many aces they had. I think um, when other servers were behind the line and even when he was behind the line, they still stood in there. They didn't get nervous. They, they stuck with it, and that's all you can ask of them. And they kept us in system when they passed, so it was good. And then next week you are at Hawaii. First you've got UCLA, I think, and then either way you've got UCLA, Paradue, Fort Wayne, and then you've got Hawaii. Yeah. Those are three good teams. What's it going to take to beat all those good opponents? Same thing you saw tonight. Good serve and pass game. Keep us in system and take them out of system, and then our blocking will do the rest. Cal, thank you for your time. Congratulations on the win. Good luck the rest of the way. Thank you. So that was my post-game interview with Cal Fisher. Cal Fisher finished up with 14 kills. He had three service aces, including the walk-off service ace, nine digs, and six blocks, which was actually a career high for him. So overall, Cal Fisher pretty much did a little of everything. Toby Easy Owenu also chipped in 12 kills. He hit 455 in the match, and he also had five blocks as well. Owen Rose... Had nine kills for Penn State. Michal Cowell had eight kills with no hitting errors. Ryan Merck had nine digs. Brett Wildman also chipped in nine digs to go along with his six kills as well. So overall, it was a solid win for Penn State, who also hit 311. Despite missing 25 serves, they had the big serves when it mattered most, and most of them came from Cal Fisher, who had three aces, like I said. They also had an unsung hero in Michael Valenzi, who had five kills off the bench. He only played three sets, and that all started in set three. And head coach Mark Pavlik basically discusses that as I caught up with him following the game, as he talks about Valenzi, as well as some other unsung heroes, as well as what worked in the five-set win over UC Irvine. Now, oh, ever since. Oh, 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 hold on. Oh, now, oh, ever since. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry about. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Technical difficulties. I actually had to split up some of this. But before I do so, um, my, my apologies. Uh, I, actually, I had to uh, split up this whole interview just because, well, for starters, I had to split this up for Twitter purposes. And, hey, yeah. Now, here's the interview, the full interview with Mark Pavlik. All right, this is Taryn Rodriguez of Set Point with Penn State men's volleyball coach Mark Pavlik following his team's win over UC Irvine. All right, coach, your team won a five-set thriller on the road against UC Irvine. You won two straight matches against two scrappy teams. What did it take to win both those matches as you had to come all the way out to California to win these matches? Maybe a good sense of direction first. But uh, I think resilience, anytime you come out here and play these teams, 
you know, Irvine is so well coached and we knew that we would have our hands full with Heno and Saudi serve. And, you know, we knew that we were going to be in positions where no matter what the scoreboard said, the crowd was going to be excited, the opponents were going to be excited, and we would have to work our way through it. And I think we did that. I, I think coming out here is more a, more a study in resilience at times than anything else. Now, the first set, it kind of slipped away from you. What did you have to do to make sure that the second set didn't slip away from you and neither did the fourth set as well? well I, I think that's, a, that's really a compliment to our guys. Uh, this is the way that this team's DNA has been built. They don't get too high. They don't get too low. They, they believe in who they are and what they can do. And, you know, and they just keep coming at you and coming at you and coming at you. I think that's been one of the strengths that this program has had over the past couple of years with this group of guys. And I think that paid off for us today because, okay, we, we lose the first one and it becomes, so what, now what? And I think this these guys really take that to heart. Now, ever since our little interview on set point, we've you've played big boy volleyball following that loss to Long Beach State. Do you think you've continued to play big boy volleyball? And what's it going to take to continue to play big boy volleyball well, up until the end? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a there's a fatigue factor that sets in, in in the middle part of the season. I think we're going through that a little bit right now. Uh, I think we're, we're at a point in our season where we want to still believe in our physicality. We want to make sure that we get the options to... To, to be physical behind the line at the net and you know we, we just got to become a little bit more fresh so um, now we're on a plane tomorrow morning and, and heading to Hawaii for the outrigger and looking forward to seeing what kind of tests we're going to get from UCLA, Hawaii and Fort Wayne and, and we, we managed to survive those somehow some way great if not we'll learn from them and we'll go back and get ready for the end of the EIVA season and uh, make sure that we're uh, we're going to take care of business in the EIVA. Kel obviously came up big, and he obviously had the uh, match clinching ace. But Toby obviously had his big boy game with late in the set, and then Owen stepped up big. Michal obviously came up big. Cole was distributing the ball well. What can you say about your team? And were there any other heroes in tonight's game? I, th I think this was this was a, a game that shows. You just got to take it one point at a time. I know it's cliche, but you know, you, Heno goes on that run in game three, and you know, basically we can't do anything, and we come back with a pretty convincing win in game four, and then we're at 8-8 eight, eight in game five, and it's a race to seven. And you got to tip your hat to Mike Valenzi coming off the bench and doing some of the things that he did and you know, some of the big swings he took. It's just it's what you train for, and you just kind of let them go and hope they embrace the competition and, and really enjoy being in this on this stage and seeing what they can do against uh, really great competition. Coach, thank you for your time. Congratulations on the win. Best of luck the rest of the way. Thanks, Taryn. Penn State outblocked UC Irvine 13.5 to 5 as UC Irvine was led by Francesco. Francesco Sani, who had 22 kills. Hilaire Heno, as I mentioned, he had the nine service aces, but he also had 20 kills. Cole Gillis added 13 kills as UC Irvine only hit 239. Irvine did not register a block until the beginning of set number three, and that was kind of surprising. It's tough to beat a team like Penn State when your blocking is not really up to par. Now, I kind of didn't really mention that to David Niffin, and I'm kicking myself for not really mentioning that, but one other positive that UC Irvine had over Penn State was they outdug Penn State 61-45. to So what they lacked in the block department, they kind of made up for, well, they drastically made up for in the dig department, as Cole Power had 18 digs while Joe Carlos had 16 digs to go along with his 47 assists which was quite nice. So overall it was I think Irvine is really getting better and after the game I caught up with UC Irvine men's volleyball coach David Niffin following his team's loss but there were quite a number of positives as Niffin also mentioned and he did confirm that Sonny or Hilary Heno broke the service ace school record at UC Irvine. All right, coach. It's another 
Barnburner down to the wire as your team fell just a bit short against Penn State. What were some positives that you could take away from this match against Penn State going into the first week of conference play? Well, that's about as mature of a team as you're going to see in Penn State with, you know, fifth and sixth year seniors coming back. Um, you know, that's that's a lot of time and understanding of what it takes to be good down the stretch. So I think just hanging with a really mature team is, is important as we continue to grow in maturity ourselves. Now, Hillier was just phenomenal. 20 kills, nine service aces. Do you know if those nine service aces are like a school record by chance? Stacy is nine a record? Yeah. yeah, I think he he had set the record earlier this year with eight. I think he just broke his own record with nine. Amazing. And then Francesco obviously was amazing with 22 kills. Cole obviously chipped in with 13 kills. Joe was distributing the offense. Like, what can you say about the offense and just how everything was just clicking all together yeah. tonight? Uh, we're, we're definitely trending the right way in terms of how we're running it. We're still giving up too many points. So we're, we're still giving away too many points, I think. But I, I like the direction we're going. In that first set, you had, I don't know how many set points you had to battle back from, but you basically took that first set, 34-32. looked like an instant replay of Concordia's set to against Penn State. What did you all have to do in order to, like, snag that first set from Penn State? Well, I think whoever was going to serve in in that set was going to take it. We missed a lot of serves. They missed a lot of serves in set one. And then in that fourth set, it looked like they were going to run away with the fourth set, but then you all were basically about to steal that fourth set, but you just fell a little short. Like, what are ways you could, like, improve to possibly make sure you could possibly steal that set the next time you're in that situation? I feel like a lot of what we want to continue to work on as a team is our uh, mental resiliency. There were just some some plays in there that weren't necessarily volleyball skill-wise. It just felt like a little bit distracted or loss of focus or, uh, yeah, just compl not complacency, but uh, distraction. And then you open up Big West Conference play with UC San Diego. They went five with Ball State and fell just a bit short. What's it going to take to upend the Tritons? You know, we haven't looked at the Tritons much yet. We're familiar with, obviously, their personnel, their players, um, but it feels like kind of a new look, new energy with a new coach. Uh, so we'll take a good look at them this week. So Big West Conference play is starting to get into full swing as it's not just going to be UC San Diego and CSUN. UC Irvine is dipping the toe in. UC Santa Barbara plays Long Beach State. I'll get more into... That later, the only team that hasn't really cracked is that hasn't really dipped its toe into the Big West Conference play is Hawaii. But again, I'll get more into that later. Um, to take my final, to have my final thoughts of UC Irvine and Penn State, I thought UC Irvine had a lot of great moments. My only negatives for Irvine was that they had. 13 aces, but they also missed 20 serves. Now, it shows how aggressive UC Irvine can serve, and when Hilir Heno has 9 service aces, they're doing something really good. And 9 aces against Penn State. That's when you know he is determined, and that's when you know he is ready to basically will your team to victory. The problem was, is that you can't have 5 blocks against Penn State. Against a t team that only has 59... Okay, 59 kills. That's still only three more, three less than your team. You have to have more than five blocks against the number three team in the nation. Because if you don't have more blocks than... That more than five blocks, then you're going to be at the mercy of Cal Fisher, Toby Ezionu, Owen Rose, Brett Wildman, and a bunch of those other big-time hitters. So, overall, for UC Irvine, I agree. They are trending in the correct direction. I think they are going to be a team that no one wants to play if they make the NCAA tournament, let alone the Big West Conference tournament. However, they have to make the NCAA tournament first, and they have to really prove themselves in Big West Conference play. I really am excited to see what this team can do come Big West Conference play. I won't be able to see them again just because 
well, I won't be able to see them again until the end of the regular season when they play Long Beach State at the Brent Event Center. And I guess the, uh, whatchamacallit, well, I might not be able to see them again until that Brent Event Center match, but um, I am excited to see them again. I will be able to see them again, and I will probably be able to see that Big West Conference tournament, but um, overall, it, they are a great team. They are well coached. They have a great setter in Joe Carlos. Their libero Cole Power is fantastic. They've got some great hitters in Halir Heno, Francesco Sani, Cole Gillis, Doug Dom is fantastic. They just gotta figure out the blocking. Now, Penn State is an aggressive team. Toby Eziano is so tough to contain, and he didn't really have that many errors. Like, Obviously, he did have one overpass kill, which went wide. That wasn't all his fault. So, realistically, Toby is the one who had one unforced, one error, one unforced error by himself. So, overall, for Penn State, I just think I just think that they were just cerebral. If you ask me, they were just playing cerebral, and for me, that's they prove that's how number top three teams are. They play cerebral, especially on the ro- road, and they overcome adversity at every turn, at every twist, at every corner. But UC Irvine is really trending in the right direction. Like, their last top 10, or not top 10, their last top 5 win was against Long Beach State in conference play. And I would not be surprised if they were to challenge Long Beach State or Hawaii. It is going to be tough to win at Hawaii. I will say that. But if if that uh, scrimmage back in, what, October taught us anything, it's that Irvine can hang with the big boys. They were able to hang with Penn State, and they were able to hang with UCLA, and they hung tough with GCU. I'm very interested to see what they could do against Long Beach State and Hawaii. Especially since that Long Beach State match. Uh, some people are saying that Long Beach is not the same Long Beach State team. Um, well, first of all, I will say Long Beach State is indeed a good team. They're still a very good team. I don't know where they're getting this whole, they're not the same Long Beach State team like last year. Obviously, not having Alex Nikolov hurts them, but they're still a great team. But they're just it's just going to take time to replace him. That's why they have Sotiris Shiapanis. And they still have pretty much everyone back from last year. So, all in all, I just think that Long Beach State, they're, they're still getting there. They are getting there. But we'll see. Alright, so that is that for... Alright, so that is that for... For the NCAA Men's Volleyball Week number 9 from last week. So let's jump on over to the AVCA Men's National Collegiate Coaches Poll for for March 6th. So 15 through 11 consists of Ohio State at 15, Charleston at 14, CSUN at 13, Stanford at 12, and Ball State at 11. 10 through 6 consists of USC at 10, Loyola at 9, BYU at eight, Pepperdine at six, and UC Irvine at or Pepperdine at seven and UC Irvine at six. Five through one consists of Grand Canyon at five, Long Beach State at four, Penn State at three, UCLA at two, and you're still number one team in the AVCA National Collegiate Men's Volleyball Coaches Poll is Hawaii. So that those top three teams, Hawaii, UCLA, Penn State, they are going to be playing in the Outrigger Invitational, which, boy howdy, that's going to be quite something that I'm going to be discussing in the second half of the uh, of the show, and that's going to be quite something. Meanwhile, USC, they jumped back into the top ten, which I kind of think that's pretty funny, just because USC beat Menlo, an NAIA school, but... They did, but you got to remember, USC also beat CSUN twice this season. So, 
Yeah, might be tough to argue that one. And then Ball State remained at 11 just because they lost to Long Beach State, but they beat UC San Diego in five. Stanford fell from 10 to 12 just because they lost to CSUN in straight sets. CSUN jumped from jumped one spot just because, well, for starters, well, yes, that's a good win over Stanford, but they it's they don't really have the wins to back up their case of moving up too much. I mean, don't get me wrong, CSUN has done amazing, but it's like you look at their winning streak, it's not overly great. But again, I still tip my hat to CSUN for all their success and their great turnaround. And then Charleston, again, while they're undefeated, well, not undefeated, while their own, only loss is to George Mason, and what, they're like 15-1, and one, I want to say, or is it like 14-1? and one? It's they, Their only ranked win was against Ohio State, which is right below them. So that's kind of the reason why every every one nine below is where they're at, and then Loyola is, is still, and then everyone is still right where they're at, one through nine. But I think a whole lot of answers are going to be at, or a whole lot of questions are going to be answered once uh, this week is said and done, and this is going to be an important week in terms of the NCAA men's volleyball season. And on that note, that's going to do it for last week and the ABCA Men's Volleyball Coaches Polls. We're going to take ourselves a quick little commercial break. When we come back, we will discuss week number 10 of the NCAA Men's Volleyball season. And we'll discuss some NCAA Beach Volleyball. And we've got some high school boys volleyball to discuss. Don't go anywhere. You are listening to Set Point here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. What is going on, everybody? My name is Harrison Glazer, and we're coming at you from the show that never sleeps podcast. I cover the Jets, the Islanders, the Nets, and the Yankees. This is Pierre Moss, and I cover the Mets, Knicks, Rangers, and the Giants. Our show is live every Wednesday through Spreaker and a bunch of other ways to get our content. Again, we're the show that never sleeps podcast. We talk about all those New York sports. It's a lot of fun. We get into all of it. Please tune in. Again, that's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And we look forward to having you guys right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Hello, ladies and sinners. Hello, sports fans around the world. Hello, IE Sports family. This is Cale Henderson, the host of IE Vegas, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio. If you folks are interested in sports in the Vegas area, if you're wanting to have a blast for one hour every Tuesday night from 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, This is a show built for the Vegas sports fans where we feature the Las Vegas Raiders, the Las Vegas Golden Knights, the Las Vegas Aces, and the University of Las Vegas, Nevada Rebels. Hopefully, fingers crossed, MLB team coming soon. Either way, if you folks are looking to have a blast for one hour each and every week, tune in Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you folks are interested in Vegas sports news, Go to our Twitter, at SinCities, underscore I-E-S-R, and you can speak with me, the host, Kale Henderson, at Kale underscore Henderson on Twitter. At any time, be happy to reply. Always willing to reach out to our fans. Again, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, 
and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks, Cubs, White Sox. We'll cover them all, plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi Town Weekly every week right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Hey sports fans, do you like wine? Well, we've got the show for you. This is Let's Wine About Sports, a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously. From the classic Cabernet Sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before. Oh yeah, we cover it all. And we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well. Football, hockey, collegiate, women's sports, it doesn't matter. We're going to talk about it all and we're going to whine about it all. So join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. With segment number two of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Definitely check out all of our amazing shows, such as the show that never sleeps with Pierre Moss, Sin City Sports with Kale Henderson, Chi Town Weekly, which comes on one hour before Set Point does with Adam Karnick, and let's run about DMV Sports with Mike Pat, which goes on at every Friday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, 9 p.m. Eastern, which is its new time. But on that note, let's get on into the second segment of Set Point. So let's jump on in to week number 10's matches. So we have a big week this week. So we'll start off on Wednesday as number 11 Ball State plays Grand Canyon. So it's a non-league, non-conference matchup between the Cardinals and the Lopes. Grand Canyon needs a little bit of a break from all this MPSF madness while Ball State is kind of on its little West Coast road trip as they're taking a break from all this MIVA madness. So it's a good little matchup right here between the Cardinals and the Lopes as Cardinals are... This is a good little test right here just because next week they've got Ohio State. And that is a big-time matchup right there just because second place is still on the line. But as for this matchup right here against... Grand Canyon, I think this is kind of a good test right here just because Grand Canyon is a good offensively orientated team. Now, for Grand Canyon, this is a nice little test right here just because Ball State is a good blocking team just because on occasions they're not going to have a night where they run into Long Beach State, which limits them to only eight and a half blocks. 
So for Grant, for Ball State, don't expect them to have only eight and a half blocks like they did last Friday against Long Beach State. Expect them to have like somewhere in double digits in terms of blocks. So for Ball State, I think they'll have double digit blocks. But for Grand Canyon, expect them to have like Jackson Hickman, Camden Gianni, and all their other offensive powerhouses come out to play in terms of this home matchup. Then on Thursday, we have number 10 USC playing at number 7 Pepperdine. So this is an interesting matchup right here. Pepperdine lost twice last week to Hawaii as they're going to look to get back on track against number 10 USC. USC is back in the top 10, but for how long? This is probably the best time for Pepperdine to get back on track just because they're playing a young USC squad and if there's ever a time for Pepperdine to get back into that MPSF race, this is the time just because the Waves know if they want to keep pace with UCLA and GCU, they have to win a good portion of their MPSF games if they want good seeding in that MPSF tournament. Obviously, the matches are going to be at Stanford. This year's tournament is at Stanford, and I don't know if everyone knows this, but the MPSF tournament is going to take turns in terms of being where it's at. Like, this year it's going to be at Stanford, and then next year it's going to be at another host site. Like, it's there's not going to be a certain number one seed hosting. The two teams will also meet on Saturday at USC at the Galen Center. So that's just some food for thought right there. I do expect Pepperdine to get back on track, but don't underestimate USC. Simon Gallus is good, and Dylan Klein is having a fantastic season. I think Dylan Klein has been one of the more bigger and better bright spots for those Trojans this year. I really think that USC... I, is not underestimated. Like, you saw what they did to Stanford. I think Stanford kind of got a little broken after losing to USC. I'm not trying to say that USC broke Stanford. I'm just saying that I feel that Dylan Klein and USC kind of wilted the Cardinal spirit. But that's just my opinion. And then this is kind of the last of these little notable matchups. Number 15, Ohio State, heads down to Provo to take on number 8, BYU. This is kind of one of those interesting matchups. This is kind of a... Is this, I guess, like a Mideast matchup as they take on a Pacific East matchup? As they as Ohio State goes to Provo to take this matchup. We don't get to see this matchup. I don't even remember the last time we saw Ohio State take on BYU. The last time I saw this matchup was... Probably the national championship matchup back in 2017 when I was in junior college. But um, this should be a nice little matchup right here between the Cougars and the Buckeyes. Ohio State's trying to get back on track after they fell to Charleston. While BYU's trying to get back on track after they lost twice to GCU. It's a good little non-conference pair of matches right here just because... Ohio State, they know that they have a pair of matches against what's their face, uh, Ball State, and then BYU resumes conference play in the MPSF, and they know how big that is just because BYU knows they can't afford too many losses. They're having a great season, and oh, actually. No, no, they do resume MPSF play uh, next week following the matchups against Ohio State. They resume play against Pepperdine at uh, Smithfield House. But they do have to play uh, Ohio State. They do get to play Ohio State this week. And this is going to be somewhat of a test. I would not underestimate Ohio State just because Ohio State, they're scrappy. And they've got some good players like Jacob Pastor. And they're well coached. Kevin Birch is a very good head coach, and those boys know how to fight night in and night out. So if I'm Sean Olmstead and his crew, I would not underestimate Ohio State just because Ohio State wants to prove that they still deserve to be ranked. And they want to prove that they are battle tested for that matchup against Ball State, those pair of matchups against Ball State. As Larry B pops in the chat room, he says GCU is solid. Yeah, I agree. And. 
GCU is going to need to be careful against Ball State, as is BYU is going to need to be is going to need to be careful against Ohio State. So those are the matchups again for week number ten. Except not really because. There is one big event for week number 10 that I have to make note of, and that is the Outrigger Invitational in Hawaii. And it's a three-day event. It's going to take place at the Stan Sheriff Center, a.k.a. the Simplify Arena in Honolulu, Hawaii. So right off the bat on Thursday, we get number three Penn State versus number two UCLA. Already we get a top Three matchup, and this is round two between the Nittany Lions and the Bruins, as UCLA's only loss was to Penn State back in the Pac-12 Big Ten matchup, and it's sure to be a barn burner between these two teams. Now, Penn State, they're going to have to play pretty better than what they did against UC Irvine, because if they play like they did against UC Irvine against UCLA, it's not going to be pretty, but Penn State was solid against Irvine. They limited UC Irvine's block, and they came up big down the stretch, and they had 13.5 blocks. So overall for Penn State, if they force UCLA to making mistakes and they capitalize off those mistakes, then they'll hand UCLA a second straight loss. And Well, not second straight loss, but a second loss of the season. And this could be huge for Penn State just because this could also be a preview for the NCAA semifinals. Like, these two teams could meet in the semifinals if all goes well. But I'm looking too far down the road. But number two versus number three, this is big time right here. Following that matchup is Purdue-Fort Wayne versus number one Hawaii. Now... Purdue-Fort Wayne's kind of the odd man out, and I feel bad for Purdue-Fort Wayne just because I think Purdue-Fort Wayne is a good team. I think Purdue-Fort Wayne is a solid team, and I think they're a little underrated. The problem is is that they don't have... They don't have the standout wins like their older brothers do in the MIVA, like Loyola does, or... Ball State does, or Ohio State does. Like, Purdue-Fort Wayne, I think, has like 10 or 10 plus wins. Uh, Yeah, they're 12 and 5, but they're 3 and 4 in conference play. And looking at their wins, they haven't really beaten some of the better teams. They've lost to teams like NGIT, which isn't really a bad loss. It's just not the greatest better losses it's not one of their better losses and they really haven't beaten some of the more better teams like they lost they narrowly escaped with a five set win over george mason uh they lost to lindenwood in five they lost to ohio state they lost to ball state um they beat lewis which wasn't bad and their most recent loss was to loyola of chicago so against ranked competition purdue fort wayne has not been great there's just no better way of saying that. And it's not trying to be mean to Purdue Fort Wayne, but it's not trying to sugarcoat it in any way, shape, or form. Now, that being said, all of Purdue Fort Wayne's opponents are going to be ranked opponents. They're playing the number one, number two, and number three team of the nation this week. So I hope Purdue Fort Wayne likes competition because they're getting that competition this week. Starting with the number one team in the in the nation, Hawaii, and the host team. So we'll see what happens with Purdue Fort Wayne. But one thing that those Mastodons are going to benefit from playing this stiff competition is that it's going to toughen them up for MIVA play or for the rest of MIVA play, just because they will ha- they will eventually have to play the rest of the MIVA opponents, like. Like those uh, Loyola Ramblers, they have to play Loyola round two, and they have to play. They get to they have to play Charleston, which isn't in their conference, but that is an intriguing opponent, just because Charleston they are ranked as well, and believe it or not, Loyola is actually they have to play Loyola right after Charleston, which that's kind of convenient. They have to play McKendry, which is solid. Lewis has been. They've kind of been disappointing, but it's kind of tough to say they've been disappointing just because they've 
kind of been in a bit of a rebuild this year. And then they have to play Ohio State and Ball State again. So this whole thing is kind of going to be a test for Purdue-Fort Wayne, but it's going to be a different sort of test. It's going to be to toughen them up for the remainder of their MIVA schedule and for Charleston. So if for some reason Purdue-Fort Wayne wins one of these top three matches, then bully for them. Then they pulled off a top three win. But if they don't, and they're they're competitive against these three opponents, then look out rest of the MIVA. Purdue Fort Wayne is here to play. Then we jump over to Friday. Purdue Fort Wayne takes on number two UCLA. Don't really need to say much about that. After that matchup, we have number three Penn State taking on number one Hawaii. This one's gonna be a barn burner. This one's gonna be really good. Now, here's the thing for Penn State. They have I wouldn't say they've gotten their sea legs in terms of playing outside of the East Coast. They played on the West Coast last week, playing Concordia Irvine and UC Irvine. They won both those matchups. I should have mentioned that they played Concordia Irvine. They swept them, but they had this marathon second set. They won 40-38, to which, if you look at it, you could play that second set, and that would be one full match where you would basically win in dominant fashion in all three sets. But Penn State won that marathon of a second set in against Concordia Irvine, which was quite bananas. And that is the longest set of this season, which eclipsed the previous record between UC Irvine and McKendry. So there's your little Snapple fun fact right there. So back to Penn State and Hawaii. I hope Penn State got its money's worth playing at Irvine and Concordia Irvine just because now that they know what the hostile environments are like when it comes to playing in those little those little environments on the West Coast, they know what it's like playing at Stan – they know what it's kind of going to be like playing at Stan Sheriff Center. I know that's not really the best comparison. Like Stan Sheriff Center is going to be five times as loud as – the Brent Event Center, and the CU Arena at Concordia Irvine. So I hope Penn State is ready for an extremely r- loud crowd, but I'm sure Rec Hall has been loud for them. I'm sure it was like loud when Long Beach State came to town, or when UCLA came to town, or USC came to town, but I digress on that. And then closing out the Outrigger Invitational, we have Purdue-Fort Wayne taking on number three, Penn State. And then the final match of the Outrigger Invitational, it all comes down to this matchup. Number two, UCLA taking on number one, Hawaii. The match of the week right here. This is going to be the barn burner that ends all barn burners. It's going to be a barn burner, a humdinger, a dandy of a matchup, a flame broiler. You get the picture. It's going to be a big-time matchup right there. This could be a preview of an NCAA championship right here. Am I stirring up words? Maybe. But this is why this is one of the bigger weeks for Hawaii. This is why I said this, along with last week and next week, are the three biggest weeks for Hawaii in the regular season. Because this is really going to test those Rainbow Warriors. Hawaii is the number one team in the nation. They got to really prove it. This is why Hawaii is the reigning champs. They're going to have, they have that target on their back. They have to really prove it. And I hope for their sake, they can rise to the challenge. There you have the home court. They've got the home crowd. They are going to have to really prove it. And they got their championship rings last week. So now they're going to have to prove it. In the Outrigger Invitational, which did not get played last year. The Outrigger Invitational did not get played last year due to most likely COVID protocols, which was a bummer, but it did come back after a two year hiatus, which is good. But it is amazing that we're going to get number one versus number two. Thank you to Hawaii for putting UCLA on the docket when it comes to this this outrigger invitational as well as Penn State like I don't think you I don't think Hawaii could have done a better job of putting 
these teams on the docket in terms of the Outrigger Invitational. And Purdue Fort Wayne is a solid team. Like that's probably a really good team to put on there as well. It's not I mean Purdue Fort Wayne isn't flashy, but 12 wins is not bad. Like wins are tough to come by nowadays and for them it's a testament to how tough of a program they truly are and they know they're going to have to face Hawaii or UCLA or Penn State come the NCAA tournament and they're going to have to face them right now. Why not face them right now? And next week they're going to play Charleston to end off their non-conference slate. And then right after Charleston, they got Loyola of Chicago, which is going to be so fun when they play that ranked opponent. And that's going to really prove to, it's going to really prove to see what they've learned in these ranked matches. But we'll see what happens Come next week. I really want to see what Purdue Fort Wayne can l- learn this week. All right, but that's that for the NCAA men's volleyball matches to watch for in week number 10. We're already in week number 10. Good gracious. So let's jump on over to some NCAA beach volleyball. So if I recall correctly, we now have only four undefeated beach volleyball teams. NCAA beach volleyball teams. So on Sunday... We had Florida State losing, number two Florida State losing to TCU 4-1. to one. Yes, 4-1 to one, surprisingly, just because TCU is number three. Yeah, it wasn't that, it wasn't ultimately surprising. TCU is a very good team. My only true surprises is, is that Florida State has been so battle-tested, while TCU hasn't. And Florida State has also played more matches than TCU, so it's like... What happened? (laughs) So, it's early in the season. I won't judge this ultimately, but it just goes to show that TCU is not to be slept on. But the big surprise this past weekend was USC pulling off not one, but two comebacks in the Pac-12 South Invitational. So the first comeback was against Stanford, and they were down 0-2 in their Invitational, and I'm like, They're down 0-2 to which team again? And it was to Stanford. I'm like, oh no. USC, you can't be doing this. But then they won the next three uh, matches, and then they wound up winning the duel altogether against Stanford. It's like, okay, well, that was uneventful again. The (laughs) USC is going to really put their fans in the ER in terms of beach volleyball. Last week they did it so against Long Beach State, and then they did so against Stanford. But it gets but it gets a little bit better. So yesterday, I actually was seeing a bit of before the UC Irvine Penn State men's vo- volleyball match. I saw a bit of the duel against UCLA. So the first duel, the two pair. So there's one pair, two pair, three pair, four pair, five pair, based on your skill level. So the two pair got done, and UCLA won that pair, and basically. It was like UCLA UCLA was kind of expected to win this match. And I'm thinking it'll be it'll be interesting to see how USC stacks up against UCLA or USC stacks up against UCLA. And I'm thinking if USC finds some way to win this, it'll be probably by some virtue of a miracle. So it was the first first pair of the number 2 pair. UCLA wins that one. And I'm like, uh-oh, that's not a good sign. And then I think it – then there was the four pair. And then that one goes the distance, three sets. And then UCLA wins that one. And it's like, oh, no. So I'm just looking at this. I'm like, okay, well, there's no way UCLA is going to lose this one. They're the number one team in the nation. UCLA has a lot of really good talent. They have Lexi Denneberg. They have Abby Van Winkle, who registered her 100th career win prior to the match against USC. So it's like, I don't see how USC blows this one. And then, as the UC Irvine-Penn State match goes on, I'm like, I wonder how USC-UCLA ended up going. And then I look at the USC USC, uh, schedule, and I see that USC managed to 
pull off the comeback win against UCLA. And I'm just thinking, you have got to be kidding me. And I'm just like, USC really pulled off the upset against UCLA. So basically, USC was down 0-2 following the 2-4 and pair. And then USC wound up winning the pairs in the 3-5-1. And and they won... Wound up winning courtesy of the Norse twins, Audrey and Nicole Norse. And that was how they basically won the meet against UCLA. And they even got to win the victory bill, which... (laughs) That's gotta suck for UCLA. That really... (laughs) I don't know how you blow that, though, UCLA. You're the number one team in the nation. You return a majority of your players, and you wind up whiffing an 0-2 lead. I, I, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. It, it. I mean, USC is the reigning champion. Yes, I'll give them that. And yes, USC, it was at USC, but that's no excuse. UCLA. <laughs> oh my God. I was just, I was just flabbergasted by that. It's like, I just can't believe that. But I also got to mention that USC also has Delaney Maple and Megan Kraft, who I think are another amazing pair in beach NCAA Beach Volleyball. And they were just named the AVCA Beach Volleyball Pair of the Week, which, man, that's a great pair. Like, those two have a gr- uh, great future in beach volleyball. And I think Megan Kraft, who partakes in the, a- in the AVP every so often, does have a bright future ahead of her. So... Keep an eye out for Megan Kraft, as well as Delaney Maple. So, I just think that... I just think that her, along with... Those two, along with the Norse twins, they're the biggest bright spots for USC. I just am astounded that UCLA just wound up blowing an 0-2 lead. It's like they were up 0-2 in the duel, and then they wound up losing the next three matches. It's like... I I just, I'm just confused. Come on, UCLA. But I, 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 I digress. So, if we're keeping track of how many undefeated teams we have remaining, we have four. USC, TCU, LMU, and if I'm not mistaken, LSU. Which... Hasn't really beaten anyone all that much, but they will be tested this week against TCU. Pepperdine was going to make it into that echelon, but they lost to Cal earlier in in the day. Well, they beat Long Beach State, which they almost lost a 2 nothing lead themselves, and then they wound up narrowly escaping that match. And then they beat Cal in the later cap day at Malibu, which... Or, no, Pepperdine wound up losing to Cal in the later cap game, which was their first loss of the season. So, yeah, Pepperdine is no longer undefeated. Good job, Pep. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Pepperdine's a solid team. No, I'm not trying... No, they're not the Raiders. (laughs) Anyway. So, yeah, you're... Unless I'm mistaken, unless I am forgetting a team, your four undefeated teams that are... Still undefeated are LMU, TCU, LSU, and USC. The AVCA polls, as of this recording, do not come out until Tuesday. I imagine the num- the new number one is probably going to be TCU. If I had to guess, it'd probably be TCU. As much as I think it's going to be USC, I think TCU is going to be the new number one. But I could be wrong. We'll see. All right, so that is that for the some NCAA beach volleyball talk. Um, like I said, TCU and LSU facing one another is going to be a great test. It's going to be a great test for LSU just because they haven't really faced anyone of note a whole lot. Their only true test was against South Carolina, which isn't anyone to ride home about. So if they beat TCU on Friday, then bully for them. They also play TCU on Saturday, so 
that's going to be quite interesting. And they also have UCLA and Florida State next Friday. So LSU is finally going to see its schedule pick up quite a bit. And for UCLA's sake, they better move on from this loss because I don't know how you blow an 0-2 lead. So that's a big yikes. And for that to happen on your opponent's home floor while they get to ring the victory bell, that's a big ouch, man. It, uh, youch. I feel, I kind of feel bad for Stein Metzger. Because that sucks, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it does. <laughs> Alright, but that's enough about NCAA Beach Volleyball. So let's jump into some high school boys volleyball as we had the most highly anticipated Best of the West tournament as, believe it or not, it was fairly wide open this season as there were a lot of talent but believe it or not I was I was kind of surprised at uh, the winner of this tournament so to make a long story short when it comes to the when it came when it came to the uh, teams that advanced through pool play I'm just going to like skim through the uh, pool play th- through the teams that advanced through pool play. So, the teams that advanced through pool play were going through I'm going to just going to skim through the p- pools. So, pool play So, f- advancing out of pool pool 1 was Newport Harbor and Clovis East. Pool 2, Loyola and Iolani out of Hawaii. Pool 3, Corona Del Mar and Moana Lua. They spelt Moana Lua wrong. FYI. Moana Lua is from Hawaii, by the way. Pool 4, Miracosta and San Clemente. Pool 5, Tesoro and Torrey Pines. Pool 6, Beckman and St. Francis. Pool 7, Kamehameha Kapalama, which is also from Hawaii, in Modern Day. And Pool 8 is Santa Barbara and Servite. And yes, it's the same Modern Day and Servite that's also good at football as well. So, the only surprises that I saw that did not advance out of, or that did not advance into this, to the top 16 was Huntington Beach. I was very surprised that they did not advance to the top 16. And I, I was a little surprised just because Huntington Beach was so good going into this tournament, and I was even telling a few of my buddies that Huntington Beach could actually make some noise, but... They kind of didn't, but it is what it is. It's still early in the season for Huntington Beach. Anyway, so the gold division bracket, um, again, I'm just going to skim through the results. So, so the round of 16 consisted of Newport Harbor defeating Modern Day in the first round. Then Santa Barbara defeated Ayalani, Moana Lua swept to Soro, Miracosta defeated St. Francis, Corona Del Mar defeated Torrey Pines, Beckman defeated St. Clemente, Clovis East outlasted Kamehameha Kapalama, and this was the shocker right here. Servite defeated Loyola in three sets. I was very surprised to seeing Servite defeating Loyola, just because Loyola is perennially good, and Servite lost a majority of their talent from last season. I did not think that that was going to happen. And this is no disrespect to Servite. But Loyola is perennially good year in and year out. And they always do good in this tournament. But for them to lose in this tournament in the round of 16, big oof right there. All right, and then, oh, and I didn't really go over the set scores, but I'll go over the set scores in the uh, quarterfinals. So, in the quarterfinals, Newport Harbor defeated Santa Barbara 25-14. 25-14. Moana Lua swept Miracosta 25-17, 25-21. Corona Del Mar swept Beckman 25-18, 25-21. And Clovis East swept Servite 25-21, 26-24. Then in the semifinals, Newport Harbor swept Moana Lua 25-13, 25-20. I was very surprised that Newport Harbor swept Moana Lua. I did not know much about Moana Lua until I read that Moana Lua had two, count them, two players going to the University of Hawaii as they had a 6'4 and 6'8 player going to the University of Hawaii who actually transferred from California and Texas. And it's like, gee, many Christmas, dude. 
how is Newport Harbor going to beat that? And it's like, they they literally thrashed him. And it's like, I don't know what it is about Newport Harbor. I, I mean, I cover Newport Harbor quite a bit, but it's like, Newport Harbor must have this secret stuff that they have. But in all jo- all jokes aside, Newport Harbor really comes prepared. They train hard, and they're well coached. And as for the other semifinal, Clovis East defeated Corona Del Mar 19-25, 25-23, 15-12. Now, I was surprised at this. Uh, Corona Del Mar has two really good players. Sterling Foley, who is a part of the USA U19 team, who was actually committed to going to USC, but he's only a junior. And then they also have this other really talented player, George Bruning, who is committed to going to Pepperdine, as he is also a senior. Um, Clovis East does not have a really, they don't have the tallest team in the world. And unfortunately for CDN, they kind of ran out of gas after that first set or actually midway through that second set from what I was told. So unfortunately for the Sea Kings, they kind of just gassed out against Clovis East. Now, Clovis East, I did see it a couple times in pool play. They are a very scrappy team. I'll say that, but I did not expect them to lose to Corona Omar. Like, CDM, I see them fairly often. They have some really good teams, and while they're, I do personally know their head coach, she does a great job with that program. While that team is still fairly young, and they have a second-year setter who's only a sophomore. They have a libero who is a sophomore. I still am very surprised, but I guess it's just growing pains. But, hey, time will tell. So, in the final of the Best of the West tournament, to my utter surprise, well, not really to my utter surprise, Newport Harbor swept Clovis East 25-23, 25-14, and they won the Best of the West tournament. I want to say that Newport Harbor also made history as they became the first team to win the tournament with a first-year head coach. I don't know if that is 100% true, but it's like, oh my. Now, their head coach, Andrew Mabry, has been a part of the Newport Harbor program, but this is his first year as head coach. So he has some familiarity with the program, but I digress. So the MVP of the of the uh, tournament was Jake Reed, who is bound for Loyola of Chicago. So the Ramblers are getting a good one. All tournament was Jake Re- or yeah, all tournament was obviously Jake Reed, but also Luca Kirchie of Newport Harbor, Riggs Guy of Newport Harbor, and then I think there was a few other. Uh, I, I I don't know if they uh, posted their all tournament team yet, uh, because last I checked, they did not post their tournament team, and they did not, which is disappointing. So they did not post their all tournament team, and I am disappointed. So all I could just tell you is that Jake Reed was MVP, and then the Newport Harbor guys that I just mentioned were all tournament. I imagine that Sterling Foley and George Bruning were all tournament as well, but I can't really fully confirm that. But it is what it is. All right, but that is that for the uh, Best of the West tournament. Um, I will say this. I still think C- the the CIF Southern Section Division One Championship is still wide open. Not trying to take anything away from Newport Harbor, but while they did win that tournament, there's still lots of talent lurking in that CIF Southern Section Division One echelon. Like, Loyola's still good. Miracosta is still crawling with talent. Corona Del Mar looks really good. Huntington Beach is going to lick their wounds and bounce back. Tesoro, I think, is going to... Well, Tesoro is obviously going to get Nathan Draper back just because he gets back from basketball because Tesoro's basketball team, boys' basketball team, just ended. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Edison might be progressing well. Upland... That is a team that I think is under the radar right there. I saw Upland play, and that team is scrappy as heck. Like, that team is kind of like the annoying gnat of Division One, but a good annoying gnat of Division One. That could be a team that no one wants to play come playoff time, but we'll see what happens. 
All right, but that's that for some high school boys volleyball talk. All right, there's one more thing I want to discuss, and then I will send you all on your way. And that just so happens to be some NCAA women's volleyball talk. So I did not discuss this on Monday's show, or Tuesday's show, last Tuesday's show, but um, last Friday, the... Not this past Friday, but the 24th, um, the University of Nebraska actually announced that its women's volleyball team is actually going to be playing a match on August 30th in the in its football team stadium at the Memorial Stadium. So yeah, it's women's volleyball team. Let me just say that again. It's women's volleyball team is going to be playing in the Memorial Stadium. Yes, I'm yes, you are hearing that correctly. It's women's volleyball team is going to be playing at Memorial Stadium the in an 85,458 seat Memorial Stadium. And it'll be playing o- the University of Omaha in a celebration of volleyball in the state at the 100-year-old stadium. And in addition, there will also be an exhibition match between Nebraska Kearney and Wayne State as well, which will be before Nebraska and Omaha face one another. And in addition, there will also be a concert that will be going on in that uh, vicinity as well. But the musician is to be announced, which it will be a national recording artist. But this is rather big time right there, just because... Volleyball outdoors. It's indoor volleyball outdoors, not beach volleyball outdoors. It's in. It's indoor volleyball outdoors, which man, that's quite something. And and honestly, Wisconsin and Florida already shattered the record of indoor attendance record. Now Nebraska wants to shatter the record tenfold. As I could, Nebraska and slash Omaha is already known for being a volleyball. Sp- volleyball state it wants to basically up the ante tenfold and remember memorial is memorial stadium can seat over 85,000 which man if that if that actually happens if if they can seat over 85,000 it's quite it's quite amazing and yes larry it is going to be 100 years old uh, it is going to be 100 years old and this was courtesy of Huskers Illustrated. And yeah, it is going to be a 100-year-old stadium. I did not know this as well. It must must be refurbished if anything. So, if anything, it's probably got like modifications and like refurb- refurbishments and not like it's not like old or anything, but I digress. Anyway, but I think this is quite amazing for the sport of volleyball, especially in, like, Nebraska slash Omaha. What my only qualm is, is, like, if are they going national, to nationally televise this? And why can't we do this for, like, men's volleyball? Like, why can't, like, so feist? Okay, maybe I'm going a little too far with this, but why can't, like, why can't, like, the Rose Bowl do this with, like, UCLA? Or why can't, like, can't USC do this with, like, the Coliseum or something like that? Or why can't, like, what, what's, what's that? I'm blanking on the, the, uh, the uh, field name. Veteran Stadium do that with uh, Long Beach. But I don't think it could fit, like, 85,000 people in there. I don't think that can, that can be, uh, that's possible. But you get where I'm going at, but, like... I, like I don't think it can. It, I don't know if Rose, the Rose Bowl, or the Coliseum can fit like eighty-five thousand people. Just my take. But if NCAA men's volleyball can do that sort of thing, then boy howdy, that would be awesome. We'll see though. We shall see. But if NCAA men's volleyball can have that sort of thing, then I want that. I would like that. I'd like to see USC have that idea for, like, their men's volleyball team when they play, heck, I I don't know, like, who's a decent rival for USC that's not named UCLA? Pepperdine? 
Perhaps, but... Oh, oh, well, that's not... Well, actually, no, that's not a good idea. Well, like, it all depends on who's using the, the, the Colosseum. But it is what it is. Or who's using the Rose Bowl. But it is what it is. Maybe UCLA or USC could use that, take that into consideration. Maybe someone could use SoFi. At, well, no, I, I, I highly doubt SoFi. Someone will use SoFi at, as that uh, as an idea like that. If if someone uses SoFi at, as that idea, then I hope I hope to God someone fills that stadium up. All right, but that's gonna do it in regards to that bit of news. Um, one more, one more little quick tidbit before I send you all on your way. I know I said that previously. Um, there is some great news in the world of Twitter in terms of NCAA men's volleyball. The actual NCAA men's volleyball Twitter account, and yes, I am not lying. The actual NCAA men's volleyball Twitter account actually tweeted out it was the greatest thing ever. I was cleaning my glasses to seeing that it was the actual NCAA men's volleyball Twitter account. And they tweeted out the actual AVC8 top 15 coaches poll. It was amazing. And then they deleted it. But then they tweeted it back up again. So it was outstanding. I was so happy to see the NCAA men's volleyball coaches poll tweeting out. I was so happy. Everyone was so happy. So if you use the hashtag NCAA MVB, you are amazing. You are awesome. Thank you for being part of the NCAA MVB movement. Continue to be part of the NCAA MVB MVB movement just because we got to continue to make NCAA MVB continue to be part of the NCAA MVB movement just because you never know what the NCAA it is, is thinking. It is the NCAA's biggest secret. I promise y'all. <laughs> anyway, that is going to do it for this week's episode of Set Points. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time for me to drop the beat because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in to Set Point. I hope you all enjoyed this week's episode. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I appreciate you. Shout out to the chat room, Larry B, Mike Pat, and Adam Karnick. And yes, Larry B, they do have three NCAA Men's Volleyball Twitter accounts, but the actual one did get tweeted out. I can assure you the actual one did get tweeted out. Unless someone hacked it, and then someone managed to tweet it out. Um, Something to note is that the NBA just relaunched its website, or they just launched its new website, and then keep an eye out for my articles, or my previews on my teams, uh, or the NBA teams. But anyway, have yourself a great rest of the week. For everyone here at iSports Radio, this is Taron Taron Rodriguez signing off. Enjoy the rest of the week. Enjoy the volleyball action. See you all on Saturday for Long Beach State, UC Santa Barbara. See you all on Friday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show.